Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 14, Episode 140. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Monday, Steelers Nation. The Steelers technically have an OTA session today, but this is generally their fun day, their field trip day, where Mike Tomlin and the Steelers go to some event. Dave and Buster's go-karting last year, I believe, so that should be still on the schedule for them today. They'll be back for their normal practice sessions Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then next week will be their three-day mandatory mini camp. So still pretty slow right now, but a couple of things to talk about. Dave, how you doing? Uh, doing well on this Monday. Uh, you had a uh, team building exercise over the weekend, <laughs> did, uh, did you not? <laughs> a one-man team, yeah. As we talked about Friday, that racetrack event up uh, North Pittsburgh, and and I live to tell about it. It was fun. It was nerve-wracking, but it was a, a good time overall, so check that off the list. All right, so you got up to uh, – how, how fast did you get the car up to yourself? Uh, 105, which is fast, obviously, but not as fast as, as other people. I was just trying to not die was my whole, whole goal of that experience and mission accomplished. Uh, all right. So you, uh, decided to, to do all that in lieu of going to, uh, Kenny Chesney and Zach Brown band, huh? <laughs> I did not get the invite from Kenny Chesney. I thought I'd get up there on stage with Russell Wilson, but I decided to not go down downtown Pittsburgh this week. Uh, all right. Well, glad you had a good time. You deserve it. Uh, going to be... Going to be probably a slow start to the week here, as you mentioned here. We'll see what the Steelers end up doing potentially as a team building exercise today. It doesn't look like uh, TJ Watt will be there, ju- uh, judging by some of his Instagram uh, photos. Looks like he might even be out of the country right now. But uh, uh, three more probably practices Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to close out OTAs. And we will see if there's any. Who says what and any kind of developments as far as that goes, but uh, probably going to be a light week as far as things to talk about here. Sure. And so let's start with something not directly Steelers related, but it is going to be the big NFL news of the day. And just wanted to at least mention that and talk about any potential implications down the road. But Justin Jefferson signing his long term deal today, four years worth an average yearly value of thirty five million dollars. Now the highest paid non quarterback in the NFL, highest paid wide receiver and highest paid any other position besides QB surpassing the 34 million per year that Nick Bosa had received. So resetting the receiver market in a market that's already gotten hot and should continue to add big money with CD Lamb, Jamar Chase, Brandon Ayuk, either possibly or likely getting long-term deal done uh, deals done before week one. Boy, uh, when you look back at some of these guys that have gotten paid over the offseason, uh, Michael Pittman Jr. When he signed that deal, it was a little eye raising overall several months ago with the Colts there at, at 23 point three, three, three million. Uh, that looks like a, you know, a, a hell of a deal at this point right now, uh, that the Colts got with him and, uh, with, uh, with Justin Jefferson, 35 million per wow. And then, uh, obviously the highest paid at, at his position for now, we'll see what happens with CD lamb. Uh, Jamar Chase obviously has his hand out. T. Higgins uh, has his hand out with the Bengals. I think Joe Corey, uh, former NFL agent Joe Corey, who we talk a lot lot about uh, on this podcast uh, and, and 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 on the site, uh, you know, quite a bit because of his, you know, him being a former agent and all like that, uh, said uh, on Twitter this morning. J- Jamar Chase made it clear he was waiting for Justin Jefferson to reset the wide receiver market. He now has a salary floor, and he goes on to uh, tweet that structure may be the biggest issue. Obviously, the Bengals have only given traditional guarantees to Joe Burrow. And he wonders, will the Bengals make another ex- uh, exception for Chase? And, you know, the, that that kind of follows along some of the stuff we've talked about in the Steelers in the past about, you know, non-quarterbacks and traditional guarantees past the first year. Obviously, the Steelers did it with uh, 
uh, TJ Watt and Minka Fitzpatrick, but those guys were top of the market at their positions at the time that they uh, signed their respective deals. Uh, makes you kind of wonder that if the Bengals are finally going to have to uh, move off of their stance and, and also in doing so, will that result in Jamar Chase becoming the uh, the league's new highest paid wide receiver for however amount of time uh, that lasts there. And so, you know, just we, we talked just recently on the other show, all these guys starting to get up over the 30 million mark. And uh, obviously the Steelers can't pay uh, because of CBA rules and all like that. George Pickens is going to have to wait, you know, uh, one more season here to have his hand out. Uh, but boy, it sure is stacking up like 30 million is going to be the floor, uh, assuming that, that, that George Pickens, you know, ha has the kind of year that, that, you know, we all think that he can have, uh, at a minimum, you would think, I don't know what, 28 million, uh, or so would be the floor for a guy like George Pickens, but man, the, the, the wide receiver, you know, that all that's just to say the wide receiver market really has busted out this off season. A lot of guys are getting paid. It has. And that's what we talked about. George Pickens as a look ahead. If he has a strong 2024 mentioned that last week's show that he's going to look for that kind of money in 2025, not only in the average yearly value, but potential structure and, you know, future base salary guarantees. We'll see how Pittsburgh handles that. It's a down the road problem. It's a good problem to have it means the pickings and hopefully this offense had a really successful 2024, but something to think about going forward. Yeah, Dave. I mean, we talked about Ayuk when all the Steelers trade rumors and speculation swirled around April. We thought long-term deal for him about 25 million. That was kind of the number we were sitting at. And now it's going to, I think, easily be the long-term deal he'll get in San Fran will be 30 million plus. I don't know where he'll slot in. He'll come under Jefferson. But, you know, just in a couple of months, expectations have shifted dramatically. And where does Lamb come in? Where does Chase come in? Will they top Jefferson? Will they match him? Just come in under? Not quite sure what's going to happen over there, but it is a good time to be a wide receiver. Yeah, I think uh, Daniel Salib, you know, who we talked about a lot earlier in the offseason because of some of the contract projections that he had, uh, you know, going into free agency and, and, you know, he, he was, he was pretty spot on on a lot of those that we talked about here. And he tweeted, a, I think a couple of days ago that he expects, uh, I to come in somewhere at around, let's see, what did he have? I at four years, 116 million. So what's one sixteen? Divided by four, he also has 70 million in new guarantees that he kind of expects uh, for there. And 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 uh, on top of it, he had Justin Jefferson at four years, 140 million. So mm. uh, good, good, good on him. That's 29 million per year. Are you four years, 116 million? So we'll see if he can get to that 30 club or be just under that. Right. So I mean, I, I, I. Salib does a really, really good job with these market projections as far as these players go. So that and that sounds about right on Ayuk somewhere around that 30 million mark. And Jeremy Fowler, I think, going into the weekend had a report on Ayuk saying something along the lines that, you know, uh the two sides aren't at a sweet spot yet. But uh after maybe entertaining some offers, you know, earlier around draft time. They, they consider him too valuable to lose. So it doesn't seem like there's, you know, obviously we are recording this on June the 3rd. So that means we're officially past uh, June the 1st now. And uh, there's been no trade movement post June 1st movement around the NFL. We'll see with today being kind of the first official really business day after that, if anything transpires this week, but there's, there's really been no rumblings really that 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 anything's going to go down there so we just you know sit and wait and see if these some of these guys get paid uh especially at the wide receiver position let's take it to pittsburgh in a different position with tj watt who as you mentioned looks like he's vacationing right now um he'll be good for training camp and he'll be there mini camp next week no question about that but in terms of his future contracts mentioned pickens what he could look to get next year what about tj watt let's let's talk about when his deal expires which was of course a, a mega deal when he signed it 
several years back, late in that training camp process. What could a potential new deal look like for Watt next year? Yeah, well, first, uh, you know, what kind of spurred that is why don't you kind of go over what uh, kind of the milestone that TJ faces this season? Sure. And no surprise that TJ Watt just puts up ridiculous sack numbers, not only year to year and in his Steelers career, but also for his NFL career. So he's played 104 games, 104 starts. He's being drafted in 2017, has 96 and a half sacks. So the quick math on that three and a half sacks needed to join the 100 sack club, that triple digit group. And he's on pace to do it almost faster than nearly anybody in NFL history. If he can get eight, if he can get that three and a half sacks within his first eight games, something I find very likely, he'll do it the second fastest of anyone in official NFL history, number of games played to get to 100 sacks. The current leader is Reggie White, 96 games to 100 sacks, which is just Reggie White, which is absurd in every sack category. Second place right now is DeMarcus Ware at 113. So TJ Watt, bottom line, has a very good chance to reach 100 sacks faster than Everybody in official NFL history besides Reggie White. Where's at 113? Bruce Smith at 115, Lawrence Taylor 115, and big brother JJ Watt at 120. So something we'll of course monitor and watch and write about, assuming that it happens. But TJ Watt's sack pace is literally historical. Wow. Uh and you know, assuming he stays healthy and does what you know we think he can do and uh, I mean, he, he's going to make another run at, 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 uh, high double digit sacks in, 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 in 2024. And you got to know that he'll be pushing to try to break the sack record again, uh, and really exceed what he did. And, you know, obviously feels like he got slighted for the, uh, defensive, uh, player of the year award, all, all that, all that you know, rolled together there. But, you know, as, as things sit right now, he's scheduled, he, his new money average is a little over 28 million. Uh, and he is fourth on the list when it comes to edge rushers at this point behind Nick Bosa, Josh Allen, uh, Brian Burns uh, are all ahead of him. It'll be interesting to see if any, Who's likely to get some deals this off season here? Uh, I know the Raiders recently pushed some money forward on Max Crosby. I don't know if he's going to be do a deal. I know Trey Hendrickson has his hand out with the uh, Bengals right now, but they, they, they've obviously got their hands uh, full with uh, wide receivers. So uh, I don't know how much movement's going to be in the edge rusher market. Long story short, don't know if anybody's going to reset the market over the $34 million that Nick Bosa has. But uh, the Steelers, I don't think, uh, are going to do anything with uh, T.J. Watt uh, this offseason because he, he still has two years left on his current deal. But after this season, and you know, once again, assuming T.J. Watt stays healthy and productive, uh, all that jazz, you have to wonder if this same time next year, if we'll be talking about TJ Watt potentially a becoming the highest paid edge rusher in the league once again, and B, if TJ Watt will potentially become the highest paid non quarterback in the league, uh, once again. So, uh, he will be another year older. How old is he? 30 right now? Yeah, he just just turned 30, I believe. And his birthday is in let's see when it is his birthday. October. No, he he turns 30 in uh oh, he, okay. he, later he this turns year. 30 uh later this year. So he will be 30 years of age at this time next year and obviously have the one year left on his contract uh next year, but I mean it's very it's super plausible that this this same time next year that we'll be talking about will they or won't won't they with TJ Watt. Sure. And just looking over the top edge rusher contracts right now and over the cap, there's such a disparity, unusually so, between first place and second place in terms of that average yearly value. Nick Bosa, 34 million, occupying the top spot. And right now, currently, Josh Allen, second place at 28.25. And so almost $6 million per year separating first and second place. Don't see that for a lot of position uh, groups overall. So 
you know, Watt should easily get into the 30 million range as the cap continues to go up as well. Of course, will he top 34? He'll certainly be angling for that. Probably will do it. The question becomes just in terms of structure, would Pittsburgh do continued guaranteed you know, base salary beyond the first year? They probably will have to, but he'll be older. There'll be a little more risk, I, I guess, associated with that. But those are things we'll be talking about next year as well. Yeah, yeah. when you talk about cash expenditures during this uh, three-year period of the CBA that we just are starting this year, and we'll obviously see how the cash plays out the rest of this off season. And we've talked about, boy, it would be a good problem. I mean, you, you have some potential big deals coming up next, next off season. We, 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 we talk about what's going to happen with George Pickens. Uh, are they going to have to pay a quarterback, whoever that is either inside the organization uh, right now with one of Russell Wilson or, or, or Justin Fields, or might they have to go outside the organization uh, once again, uh, that's yet to be determined and who else is likely, uh, you know, we, we just mentioned TJ Watt could be a guy up for a deal. I think that's about the, the bulk of it, but I mean, there, there's a lot of cash that could potentially be spent by this team next off season when it comes to new contracts. Sure. I, I think next off season might be even more active and, and zany than this off season, at least in terms of the internal candidates. We talk about what's going to happen with Najee Harris, with George Pickens, with TJ Watt, with the quarterbacks, with maybe a James Daniels and whoever else becomes a part of that group as well. So yeah, it's going to be a lot of money. Maybe Pittsburgh is intentionally not spending a ton of money this year because they know that they're going to have to spend and are planning to spend a boatload of it next year. I don't know, just a thought by me. Yeah, that's uh, that that's definitely could be a plausible reason there. It, uh, we're, it's a long way out, obviously, at this point. I mean, heck, even a year from now, even though we might be talking about a T.J. Watt uh, uh, very lucrative extension, it might not happen by this same point, June 3rd, 2025. But uh, knowing... Will it take that, as long as the previous one did, though? I don't think it would. Uh, well, a a do you let let's start this way. A mm -hmm. do you think they get an extension done with T.J. Watt next off season? Not only that, will it be will it will it reset the edge edge rusher market? In other words, will he be number one again? Said and done. That that's question A. I would say yes, assuming he has a typical T.J. Watt type season around or above twenty sacks. All right, I I would agree with you there. No 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 pushback there. Then then the second thing I guess would be uh, when it when it would happen. We you you kind of agree with me. You'd be surprised if it happened be before June the third, two thousand twenty five, though, right? Probably, but you know, Omar has gotten deals done in later June. I could see post mini camp during that quiet time being the time to hammer that deal out. I think ideally you don't want to go down the road of the relatively lengthy hold in that Watt went through where you started to get kind of anxious by the time that deal finally got done. And I think Watt himself was as anxious as anybody just saying, Hey man, let, let's get this deal done and get the show on the road. So I think that time, that timeline will shift from mid to later camp to, you know, hopefully before camp a deal getting done next year. You know, obviously, you want to make sure someone his age and all like that stays healthy. And so I, I could see it trickling a little bit into training camp. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it could. I just think ideally. But my point is, I don't think it would take as long as the last deal because also you've already broken the dam in terms of the the base salary guarantees. You're not really rehashing that. There, there may be some trickiness in terms of how Pittsburgh approaches it, but it's not going to be the unprecedented nature of what it was before that probably was one of those sticking points and getting Pittsburgh to, to, to cave, so to speak. I wonder who else in the edge rusher market might have a chance of topping Nick Bosa at 34 million as we sit here. In other words, before TJ Watt gets paid, mm -hmm. who would I'm looking be over that the list guy? here. I'm not, I, I, I don't know every situation. I'm not sure if there's a young guy that I'm missing. I'm not really seeing anybody. Khalil Mack, but I don't think Mack's going to top what Bose is going to get because the age is going to be more of a concern at that point. Uh, Hendrickson, he'll get a deal probably, but it's not going to surpass Bosa's. 
yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure what name. I don't know, you know, like I someone guess like Garrett Matt, I or something or Crosby. Yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe a Max Crosby because I think he sits at 23.5 right now. And boy, if he has another monster season uh, in, 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 in 2024, now he'll he would then be going into still having two two active years left on his contract 2025 and 2026 but he might be screaming at that point man I'm I deserve to be the highest paid uh uh edge rusher in the league OT uh, over the cap has a valuation on him even right now at 35.267 million uh there so just imagine if he if he you know, has double digit sacks, you know, in, in, mm-hmm. in, in, in 2024. So that, that could potentially be the guy that, that re- initially resets the market before what does next off season. Okay. Yeah. He did just do that last extension in 2022 and there's an additional year on that, but you're right. I could certainly see him being somebody that, that looks for that long-term deal even earlier out and it'll be hard to say no to him. All right, who else on this roster maybe going to get paid in the semi near future that would be worth talking about? I have to look over a list of names I, outside the ones I've mentioned already. I mean, I I can you probably thought about this stuff more than I have right now. When would when would Minka when would that next conversation take place? He still uh, runs through twenty twenty six, so not next year probably. Yeah, I would think. Going into the 2026, uh, ahead of the summer of 2026, I think when is when you would have the next talks about him. Okay, say Amalu, he still runs through 2025. You'd get something done early with him. My guess would be no. You kind of let that one right ride out in all likelihood. Yeah, I, I, if sitting where I'm sitting right now, it doesn't look like either of the starting guards of uh, James Daniels or Sayamalo will see another at least lucrative contract in Pittsburgh. Yeah, so I mean, outside the things we've talked about and the guys this year, potentially really Fryermuth right now, if not now, then certainly next next March, then Pickens, Watt, the quarterbacks, Najee, Maybe do something with Jalen Warren too, um, instead of the tender. But that's a, a, a you know next year conversation. Yeah, and it's a really when you look at the running back market, that's kind of dropping right. the bucket. Uh, is is the wide receiver market overinflated right now? Do you think? Uh, I mean, I think these guys are worth it. You got some really talented wide receivers that are, I think, worth every every penny. Justin Jefferson, the best in the game, and you know Lamb and Chase are right up there, and they'll soon join him on that hierarchy list. I. I yeah, you know, every every market gets inflated because of the the cap being inflated and the massive jump the salary cap made this year is going to push numbers up more significantly than maybe past years as well. So every market gets inflated to an extent because of just the nature of, of business. But I think all these guys are worth it. I don't I don't see a bad contract handed out to wide receivers in the last couple of months. All right, uh, and then obviously when talking about a couple of Steelers, the remaining of this offseason, all eyes will remain on Cameron Hayward's situation, which there doesn't seem to have been any new developments there just yet. And then Pat Firemuth, we've talked about several times. We expect him to get done at some point here. You think Cam shows up to many camp next week? I don't know if it's a guarantee that he does. Uh, I think he stands to lose a hundred and ten thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, but I think with minicamp, teams can technically either not issue fines sure. or rescind fines, right? It's not like training camp where there's no wiggle room there. Right, right. Well, what I'm and getting Pittsburgh's at is not going to find. But go, go ahead. Yeah, what I'm getting at is it it it's a drop in the bucket either way. You know, uh, uh, would would they enforce that? Probably not. Right. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. I don't think they're not going to, that's just a toxic way to to handle, you know, a guy like Cam Hayward. So we'll see, but that's a conversation again for, for next week. Right. Ideally you'd like him just to be there, even if he's standing around, but mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, it, it's, uh, I don't think anybody should lose sleep over it if he's not there. Uh, sure. Uh, and if he is there, like you said, it'll be just the standing around version of Cam right, Hayward. Right. Right. Dave, you had an interesting article this weekend talking about all, all these trade discussions that we've had in your post June first, and could that, you know, maybe start moving some pieces around and shift some trade talks and conversations? If a June trade for a player happens in Pittsburgh, it'll be the first time 
in a very, very long time that has occurred. So walk us through what you uncovered or wrote about this weekend. Yeah. And as soon as I did uh, write this, uh, uh, pe- people got lost in, in, in the fact that as if it was a shot at the Steelers and then some, some, you know, some took it as an indication. Well, it, 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 it's, it's a, uh, shot at why they won't do anything in, in, in June. No, it was more one of those sitting around thinking to myself, all right, it's June the second. There's been a lot of talk about the Steelers potentially maybe trading for someone this month. Uh, now that the, the, uh, get past the post June, uh, first cutoff and all like that. I thought to myself, well, when was the last time the Steelers actually went out and acquired a player in June? So that's the rabbit. I went down it just from a, and how how do a lot of our, our, our off season content, especially some, (laughs) some that you and I write, it's more questions we ask ourselves Mm -hmm. that we're looking for answers for that. We say, Hey, that's interesting. Let's write about it and pass it along to the more masses here. Uh, That it, in, in, Long story short, that's that's why I went down that uh, rabbit hole there because I could not remember off the top of my head when the last time the Steelers maybe did make a deal for a player in the month of June. Uh, and assuming the NFL archives and the data kept by pro sports transactions, which by the way, I you know we've we've this this site has been around for years. You and I use it. I don't, I don't want to say every week, but uh, we use it for historical uh, lookbacks uh, as far as transactions go. It's a fine site. It really is. Mm-hmm. And, and we don't talk about it enough and and probably give it its, its, its due to get whoever's running it uh, traffic there. So all you have to do is Google pro sports transactions, uh, the search interface. Uh, is very easy to use, and I've, I've used it a ton over the years, just double checking some things. But according to you know researching NFL archives and pro sports transactions, uh, the last time the Steelers traded for a player in the month of June was back in 1972. Uh, I was the ripe old age of four at the time. <laughs> uh, not only that, but it was in late, it was also late in June that that particular trade happened. The actual trade and date, June 28, 1972. And the trade included the Steelers acquiring a uh, return specialist slash defensive back Ron Garden from the New England Patriots in exchange for, there was a question mark on this, uh, for an undisclosed 1973 draft pick. Uh, They had uh, uh, pro sports transactions had in uh, a question mark next to uh, thinking it was a sixth round, uh, really a conditional 1973 draft pick. Well, once that question mark, I had to go try to chase that down first and foremost. I don't think it was ever, I never found, I don't think anything particularly stating that it was a six round uh, pick, but that would make sense. But I did find something in one of the old newspaper archives that stated that the Patriots would not be getting that that pick from the Steelers, that 1973 pick from the Steelers because uh, uh, Garden ultimately did not make the Steelers roster that year. Mm-hmm. So it was uh, per se a conditional draft pick uh, at the time and uh, relied on him making the roster for the Patriots, getting that pick. Now, Garden... Um, a lot of people, you know, it was it was really kind of a new name to me. He was originally selected by the Baltimore Colts in the sixth round of the 1970 NFL draft out of Arizona, and he had previously been traded to the Patriots early in 1971, uh, early in the 1971 season for a fifth round draft pick. And at the time, uh, Chuck Knoll uh, in June of 1972, uh, after acquiring him, reportedly said, I think he can help us with his speed. That was the quote that I have attached to him. Now, at the time, 
Uh, Garden, I think the previous two seasons, over the last two seasons, he was ranked second among uh, American Conference punt returners, having brought back 34 punts for 419 yards of 12.3 average. He also had one return for a touchdown to his credit. Uh, at, at Arizona, just to, just giving some backstory here, Garden played both wide receiver and running back. I think when he got into the uh, the league, at least, uh, you know, obviously his rookie season was his most notable. Uh, that was the year the Colts in 1970 went to and won the Super Bowl uh, over the Cowboys. And Garden, you know, had a pretty decent year as far as return uh, goes there. But uh, outside of that, he really never never made a splash in the league. The Steelers, I think, looked at him as a return specialist defensive back. He did not make the Steelers roster uh, that season. In fact, I don't even think he made it to the uh, to the preseason. I think during a scrimmage, he had some sort of a banged up shoulder and really the Steelers kind of cut bait with him. The Dolphins claimed him off waivers uh, from the Steelers that same off season. And then he ended up tearing some knee ligaments, uh, uh, during that preseason with the dolphins wound up on IR and for all practical matters, his NFL career was over at that point. So that was the only instance that I found of the Steelers trading for a player in, in, or really the last, you know, last instance that Steelers trading for a player in the month of June, uh, when it when it comes to that, and obviously that didn't work out on the Steelers' side overall. So, do, what does this mean about you know? D- does does past history, uh, blah blah? What's a legal disclaimer? Uh, uh, does not influence future results, uh, you know, all like that. Mm-hmm. But it it just goes to say that you know, obvi- for for several reasons, monumental wise, it will be huge if the Steelers trade for a player in the month of June. Uh, one of those could potentially be. Uh, giving said player a huge market reset contract. And the second, really, it, just the fact of the matter and looking at the calendar, calendar is that it would be historical that in the fact that the Steelers have not traded for a player in, 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 in over 50 years in the month of June. You know, I love going down rabbit holes, even if it doesn't mean a whole lot for the present day. And so I think it's a really cool article. I'd never heard of Ron Garden before. So I think it's always cool to tell some of those stories of past years and past players. And even the nugget you included on what he did post-career briefly, the president of the NFL is retired, uh, Players Association. So I think that stuff is always interesting, even if it's not directly impacting or have really influence on what's going to happen this June. I just wonder in general, I'm sure the number is relatively low because trades in the NFL in general are low, but how many, how many trades occur across the entire NFL each June over the last five, 10 years? I I wonder how active things are. Obviously things pick up really more in August when you get to the final cutdowns, teams are able to wheel and deal. I imagine things are generally pretty quiet in the month of June. Yeah, that would take uh, a little bit of uh, tougher research, I think, going team by team to kind of find that. Uh, we we could do it, and I could perhaps have an answer for you. Hey, heck, that might be the next thing I write about. So that's a, that just goes to show you how one – Mm-hmm. One idea kind of spurs another with 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 what we do, especially this time of season where we're sitting here on a podcast on June third. Don't rush out and buy your your uh, uh, your, your 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 Ron Garden. Uh, uh, <laughs> I just uh, ordered theaters, mine theaters jerseys here, but uh, that would that's a great question. Now, look, you you go back all that time. You know, you have to think about why why June is important now uh, as of uh, related to 50 years ago, you know, uh, you know, obviously now you got the salary cap, you got the post June 1st rule and, 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 and all those things that go along with that. So uh, today's day and age in the NFL, the month of June is more relevant than it was way back, you know, sure. Uh, even what 30, 30, you know, 20, 25, 30 years ago there because of, uh, you know, the, the ability of teams to put off future dead money cap hits because things related to post June 1st on the calendar there. But uh, within that, though, most of your NFL business has already taken part 
uh, by the time the month of June rolls around, you're in OTAs at that point. And then obviously after mandatory mini camp takes takes place, you got that lull of about, what is it, five and a half weeks or so before training camps around the NFL gets underway. Uh, For now, unless the NFLPA is able to change that next right, year. Right, right, right. Uh, I mean, surely there has been trades in the month of June in the last 10 years, right? I'm sure there's been some. I just am curious on the number. It's, you know, is it one per year? I, I don't I don't know. Uh, I'm sure there have been a couple that have occurred. I, I imagine that number is not tremendously high, though. All right. So uh, all this, you know, rolls back to, OK, it's 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 past June 1st now and sitting on our hands. Uh, you would think if teams have been waiting for the calendar to get to this point because of potential future dead money and being able to put that off and, 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 and all like that. If something was going to happen with one of these players, would you think it would happen this week? In terms of a trade? Yeah. For, for, for the Iukes and the Suttons and the, who else? I, 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 I think teams are going to be patient. I think teams want to get through their spring work overall. I believe nine teams wrap up OTAs this week, including Pittsburgh. They'll have their mini camp next weekend before their true break before training camp. They want to get through, make sure everyone's healthy, evaluate young guys. If you're say at Denver, you want to see how a Troy Franklin looks, you know, start to finish the spring work. You want to see how a Josh Reynolds a veteran is integrating into your offense overall. I don't think these teams are in a hurry to make these kinds of deals if they make them at all. By this time next Monday during the podcast, will a team have done a trade in the NFL? I think you'd asked me this last week. I said, no, I'll stick with my no answer for now. Okay. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. Do you think it'll be receiver related know. or just any random trade? Yeah. I, I think we should put specifics on it. Cause I mean, I, I, you know, uh, I, I don't think any trade should quite a okay. notable, a note, you know, you'll know it when you see it notable okay. trade. I also say zero trades of any okay. magnitude or caliber for a player. Take place. Uh, all right. Just for poops and grins. I'll take the other side. All right. We'll come back next Monday and see, see with bated breath. We'll, we'll see who uh, is dealt or if anybody is dealt. Uh, anything else there from that? It was a cool post. Cool. Look back. I always appreciate when you do those kinds of uh, historical reviews, Dave. Yeah, and, and I uh, I was interested. He's having a uh, uh, Ron Garden actually, according to Wikipedia, is still alive too. So, uh, uh, and as you stated, he went on to work as a recreational coordinator for the Marty Birdman Recreational Center in in the Tucson Parks and Recreation Department in Arizona. And as you also stated, he was once the president of the NFL's Retired Players Association. So he got on with his life's work. As Chuck Knoll would say, Dave, not a surprise to us, but one piece of information from Jeremy Fowler from a couple days ago that he is hearing that other teams expect Pittsburgh to use Justin Fields around the goal line, which is something we've discussed. Could they create a package of plays for him and some, you can call it wildcat, but obviously he's a quarterback, so it's not going to you know, be a running back, assuming that the snap, it'll still be Justin Fields, we, we presume, but essentially working on a package of plays for him in specialty situations. Other teams are expecting that. I'm expecting that. I think you're expecting that as well. Pittsburgh has not confirmed that's their plan, but it'd be hard to see them treat Fields as a true backup that has no role, even if and assuming Russell Wilson is this team starting quarterback. So I guess the question is, is drilling it down even more because we've both have talked uh, since since Fields has been acquired that we think they, that, that this team will use some sort of have some sort of package for him and specifically probably between the 20. So if we're drilling this down more into the red zone, uh, uh, look, uh, will will we likely see him uh, take some sort of uh, snaps as part of maybe some sort of. Uh, red zone package. Yeah, I, I think the easy answer to that is yes. However, comma, you know, and in, in, in part of my look at uh, Russell Wilson the last couple of years, he's been pretty damn uh, good inside the red zone overall. 
You know, if you if you look if you look at especially uh, uh, specifically from a passing standpoint, you know he's he's been okay as far as a red zone quarterback, and that's one of the things that we were kind of licking our fingers about, saying, mm, you know, this this looks like it could be really really tasty here. Uh, obviously, coming of what we've seen from the Steelers in their passing game uh, inside the red zone the last couple of years has not. So anything's probably going to be a development or hopefully, or should be a development over what we've seen. But Russell Wilson has not been bad at all inside the red zone, you know, uh, you know, not only the last couple of years, but I think it really his for, for, for his NFL career on top of it there. So, you know, knowing that, knowing what he potentially brings you uh, uh, in the passing game, uh, basically where I'm going to go with this is I think there's more of a chance to see Justin Fields' package red zone package more in the lower red zone than just generic red zone. Uh, I would drill it down even further than that. Now within all that, you know, where, where, how have most of the, the, the Steelers red zone touchdowns come in the, even just last year on the ground, right? With, with Najee Harris specifically, right? Yeah, I don't know how many Jalen Warren has. It's it's not a high number overall. So yeah, I, I think any short yardage, and obviously if you're low red zone, if you're inside the five, that naturally is your short yardage zone, and we are creating some of those plays, two point type plays. You know, that's where you can see Fields get involved. If it's you know third and one from the seventeen, I still think they could you know potentially use Fields. I don't know how much, and things will vary game to game based on game plan and circumstance, situation, etc. But yeah, I I think. You know, short yardage in any situation, red zone or not, not every time, obviously, but there'll be a package of place for him in those moments. I guess the question is, because I think we all can kind of accept that he'll be used in those moments. Will he be used outside of those moments? Will he be used on first and 10? Will they go as a change up occasionally to start a drive off that way? That might be the more interesting question. No, I kind of envision just certain down distance situations for fields between the 20s. Okay, but so you don't think on they'll do an occasional change up on say first and ten or just come in for a play just to give the defense a different look? I mean, obviously, could it happen? Yes. Sure. Uh, do, do you do think I, that I, that'll happen? I, do I think there'll be a high usage of such? Not in my head right now. Okay. Not even high, but just any, even if it's infrequent, more than a play, we'll say to avoid kind of the the odds of it all, but. Will, will will it be some sort of staple or some sort of, I shouldn't say staple, but some sort of component of this offense? I mean, why pay, paint a picture of about why you would do something like that? I mean, uh, for, on, on a first and 10 at the, at your own 38 yard line. The reason why you go up tempo and you go no huddle or muddle huddle, or you change things up to keep the defense off balance and on their toes and have them to adjust. Because when Fields comes in, you know, the way that you're able, you know, do you, let's say you come in 12 personnel or you say come in 11 personnel with Justin Fields, do you go base as a defense and really play against the run? Obviously, Fields can be a traditional drop back passer too. So do you respond to nickel that way? And you have to shuffle, shuffle different personnel off, even though maybe only the quarterback has changed for Pittsburgh. I, the same reason you probably change up and things occasionally, you know, in other regards offensively to keep the defense guessing. All right. Uh, so you're saying for maybe a series there, or you're talking just roll them out for a first and 10 play on the 38 on your own 38 yard line. I don't have it too specific. I just, I'm, I'm just trying to broaden out from, because again, I think we all understand in short yardage goal line, low red zone type moments, he can and will likely be used there. There's really probably not much of a discussion or, or debate about that. I don't think, but will he be used beyond that? And I don't, I, I'm not saying how often it's going to be used. It won't be incredibly frequently, but I think they'll, they'll use some stuff between the twenties um, in some quote unquote normal situations as a, as a changeup. I, I think that, yes, I think they will. I just, I kind of wonder, are we talking a, you know, I think we should even drill it down even, even more. Are we talking a series of plays situationally between the 20 or are we talking a situational play? I can mm -hmm. see things more in a situational, you know, all this, uh, let's throw the disclaimers out there. Russell Wilson's healthy and you know, hasn't thrown four interceptions up until that point in the game or, or, or what have you. Uh, I can see more in between the 20s, uh, a situation, second and three, 
you know, third and one, what, whatever, where fields might come onto the field for a play. But I, I, I do kind of wonder, I'm, I'm less confident in a situation developing between the twenties where fields would come out for a series of plays. I think it's possible he would, because again, even third and one, second and three, I agree between the twenties, but that's still in that short yardage bucket overall. I, I think as a, as a tempo changer, and let's say you, let's say you get a, an eight yard run by Fields off that first play, you go tempo and you run back that, or you know a similar concept off of that your second play, and those things are all kind of practice and rap. We know that package of plays. The first play will run this, the second play will run something, some sort of variation of it. So we're all speculating. We'll have to see. There's a bunch of variables. Things will vary game plan to game plan week by week. There may be times where field sees five or six snaps overall in that role. There may be weeks where he sees none. I think both will happen throughout the course of the season. But I think Pittsburgh will try to explore um, that run component in this this run-oriented, run-heavy offense. All right, fair enough. Because you could run read option back-to-back plays and you know mm-hmm. just make the defense just get up, do it again and, and wear those guys out and make them wrong each time and defend fields and war. And it, it's not going to be for, it wouldn't be for an entire drive, obviously, but it, you may run it for two, three plays in a row and then put Wilson back in and go back to your normal operating offense. I can see right. that. All right. Okay. Uh, Dave, I forget if I had asked you this question. I apologize if I did. I've, I've asked it a couple of times on Twitter and our Friday five. I, I just think it's kind of a fun question where I think people have really been torn by the answer. So I, so if I, I don't think I asked you this on the podcast, at least. And if I did, again, I apologize. But who do you think catches more passes in 2024? Jalen, uh, Jalen Warren and Najee Harris combined or all the Steelers wide receivers not named George Pickens. So not tight ends, wide receivers, excluding Pickens, who has more reception stat group as a total or Jalen Warren and Najee Harris combined. Okay, so we're just talking wide receivers only, not named George Pickens versus uh, Najee Harris and Jalen Warren combined. Correct. So Roman Wilson, Van Jefferson, Calvin Austin, et cetera, their totals combined versus Harris and Warren. I've got to take uh, Najee and Jalen. Okay. Yeah, you, you, you're you saying what, 90 receptions you think they'll be in around this year combined? Yeah, I think that's very, very plausible. I do. I think so too. Yeah. I mean, that basically where they were at last year, right? Warren caught 61. I think Harris was in the mid 20s. So right around there, a couple more check downs, better screen game this year. I wonder how many of these, these other receivers will catch. I don't know what number feels appropriate. And obviously a receiver trade, you know, will impact things if that were to occur. I really don't know what to expect production wise from the non pick and wide receivers. Uh, I'll put it to you this way. The way the roster sits right now, I could see the, uh, the, the pecking order as far as end of season reception totals, leaders, yada, yada, going, obviously George Pickens, uh, Pat Firemuth, number two, uh, flip flop, however you feel appropriate, Najee, Jalen Warren at three and four. And then, you know, I would I would guess, I mean, probably Roman Wilson, at least mm-hmm. the, uh, uh, the way things sit right now, uh, maybe having the fifth most. If you know, it might be a kind of a a, a tie or, or or a push between the second, whoever's not leading between Najee and Jalen Warren, uh, being neck and neck with. Uh, Roman Wilson for that fourth, fifth spot. Yeah, I was going to ask you, and I, I think Warren should be ahead of Harris because Warren's going to be the third down back. I mean, he had almost you know forty more receptions than than Harris did last year. Najee had twenty nine receptions in twenty twenty three. Will Roman Wilson catch more than twenty nine passes as a rookie? Yeah, that was going to be my next question to you. His best season at Michigan, Roman Wilson, was obviously 48 receptions, and that happened last season. Before that, the two previous uh, seasons, he had, what, 25 receptions each. Uh, if, if given the – what would be what would be an attractive over-under total reception number for Roman Wilson as a rookie – that would that would attract money for, for 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 both sides. You know, obviously, if you went off as forty eight, 
if he if you went off of his 48 receptions last season with Michigan and said, will Roman Wilson be over or under that? I would think most of the money would be on under, wouldn't you? I would. I would. So the question is, how much lower do you have to drop that to create a more even split? If I give you a 30 and a half, do you think that would create a good split? Yeah, because uh, you, you throwing that out. At least, at least the way the the roster sits right now, I would tend to take the over of 30 and a half, I think. But I think anywhere between that 30 to 36 might make you think. And then it all hinges on, do they acquire another receiver? That's mm-hmm. where you really get, because if they acquire a receiver, everyone's going to, I think, probably take the under on Wilson if they don't then it's much more of a conversation, but you're still not quite sure. Will Wilson be the true number two? Will he work outside? I mean, as you say, he didn't catch a ton of balls at Michigan in part because it was such a run heavy run oriented offense, but that's the offense he's playing in, in Pittsburgh. And he won't be the number one receiver in Pittsburgh as he was at Michigan. So from a production standpoint, I'm currently keeping my expectations on the lower end for Wilson still can make an impact, still can make plays, but the volume may not be there because there are so many other mouths to feed and he is not a priority in this offense. Dr- drilling everything down a little bit uh, further here, will both Steelers running backs, Najee Harris and Jalen Warren, register more, in- individually register more receptions than Roman Wilson? Mm, great question. Warren will. I'm pretty confident in that. Will Harris, and that's kind of where that dividing line 29 for Harris last year, I will say. Harris has a couple more than Wilson does. Do you have that Mike Clay prediction? Once again, Mike uh, Clay. I should not, just keep that pulled up yeah, every episode yeah. at this point. And, and once again, not that Mike Clay is just this some sort of predictive genius or anything. It's just every year this time, this early in the offseason, it, it gives a good starting point because he does lay out his own predictions every every year. So that I mean, I want to make it clear that we're not. It's not gospel as as much as it is. You have a guy that you can go to every year to, to, to yeah. look at, look at it, and and you know it's 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 a nice educated guess on his mm-hmm. part. Yeah, and again, it's always a bit more conservative. I think he projects over fifteen games because he assumes injuries. But uh, it's it's funny the numbers are actually really, really interesting. He projects twenty eight receptions for three hundred and sixty six yards and two Dutch two touchdowns for. Roman Wilson, so 28 catches. You want to take a guess at how many catches he has Harris projected to have in 2024? Oh, it's been a while since I've looked at it. 54? 28. 28, 28. okay. Warren was 54. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. But yeah, so he has Harris and Wilson tied with receptions this upcoming year. All right, now uh, read down his his total reception order of of, of, of players. For the uh, entire team? For the entire team. Okay, he's got Pickens as the leader with 68. Again, this is more conservative, 15 games, extrapolated over a 17-game season. We're in the 70s, but 68 for Pickens, 57 for Friermuth, 54 for Warren. And then he's got Jefferson, Van Jefferson, Roman Wilson, and Najee Harris, all with 28 receptions. Connor Hayward, 21. Calvin Austin with 18. Darnell Washington, 14, and then a bunch of names in single digits that too numerous to to name off there. But that's the the bulk of the list. Man, is Van Jefferson really going to contribute like this? I I, probably not. But the question is, someone's going to catch 28 something passes at wide receiver. Who's it going to be? That's the question. I mean, it's hard to argue with with most of the pecking order there, at least. Yeah, if I'm in a pecking order, Pickens should lead. Um, then he's got Friermuth next. That's reasonable. Then followed by Warren. That also makes sense. Will Could the running back reception numbers get hurt a bit because you assume Friermuth, if he's healthy and the tight ends being more involved, will they siphon away some of those underneath throws? Do you think that's a possibility? I still, th- in, in my head, I still have Warren and like, well, what did I tell you combined that I thought th- those two might have around 90? Around 90. Mm-hmm. I still think, I mean, that that's where I'm at right now, barring this team adding another wide receiver. I, I think they are okay. going to use these running backs quite a bit in the past game. And I think they should, at least the way the sure. roster sits right now. 
Yeah. Absolutely. I'm with you. Do uh, you think Pittsburgh, I know we say it most years, is this year the screen game, the running back screen game, show some life? It can't show any less life. <laughs> I know, but it's been, it's been dead for five plus years. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to think that they'll be able to use, use the screen game a lot more, uh, uh, at least be able to run it more effectively on top of everything. And look, you know, I, I, I like the prospects of, and we say it every year too, of having a couple of running backs on the field and maybe splitting one of those guys out and taking advantage of defenses that way. So, uh, and that that's playing into my optimism that both those running backs will combine for at least 90 receptions. You know? I wonder how effective the screen game, running back screen game had been under Arthur Smith in Tennessee and Atlanta, maybe something for Clayton Eckert or for you to take a look at what the, uh, successes i know in tennessee i don't know how much there was Derek Kennedy wasn't catching the ball a lot because they just you know he was running the ball each time led the nfl in carries the two years that smith was there but i wonder in atlanta if the numbers were a bit more uh frequent and positive well you know one of the things too talking about uh russell wilson was he uh you know even even at denver uh you know how short of passes that he that he threw and the amount of passes that he threw what uh, either behind the uh, line of scrimmage or you know within five yards of the line of scrimmage and and what did their backs kind of you know not not that you can rubber stamp it at all because it's a obviously a different you know uh, scheme and 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 all like that but just looking last year alone uh, believe it or not last season Samaji Perine had fifty catches in that offense last year in Denver. Uh, who was, uh, uh, Williams, uh, Javante. Yeah. Yeah. Javante, uh, 47 catches. So those two wow. backs alone, Perrine, uh, and Williams had 97 receptions, uh, last okay. season. And who was McLaugh McLaughlin? That was that, uh, undersized running back. Wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Wow. He had 31, man. They yeah. Find that, everything running backs did last year. That, that, that's what I'm getting at here yeah. is uh, they, you know, Russell Wilson was not afraid, you know, and, and obviously scheme related or what have you. But, I mean, you have three running backs there. Their, their total receiving numbers went uh, Sutton 59, Jerry Judy 54. Judy missed some games, though, didn't he? I played or in 16 okay. going to PFR. Uh, 59, 54. Perrine was third on the team. Uh, with 50, Williams 47, McLaugh- McLaughlin 31, and then Mims at 22 uh, after that. So, uh, and then even, yeah, uh, they, they use the running backs quite a bit in the passing game. So Now, to, to be fair, the tight ends weren't as involved. Adam Troutman led the team with 22, only tight end above double digits in Pittsburgh. You know, we know Fry was going to get. 60 receptions of healthy. The other tight ends are going to probably combine for, I don't know, 30, 40. So that's going to be a change. Sure. Sure. But then, then again, you did have three running backs with 30 or more. So, you know, siphoning off, siphoning off, of, you know, some of those. Yeah. For, uh, well, I mean, we, we've already stated that we think Farmer is going to be second on this team in re- receptions. Sure. Sure. But my, my point is just the running backs got a bunch of looks because the tight ends weren't getting looks that should balance out more evenly in Pittsburgh. I would think. All right. Uh, do I think the Steelers running backs will combine for more than 100 receptions? No, but I, I, I do stand on my statement that I think they could combine for at least 90. Who has more receptions this year? I'll say Van Jefferson or Cordero, Cordero Patterson. Hmm. Man, I'm, I'm not even convinced right now as we sit here right right now today that Van Jefferson makes the roster. Sure, it's part of the question. If he doesn't, then one for Patterson gets you there. If he does, yeah. maybe he has a role. I mean, he could. We don't know who this number two receiver is going to be right now. And it, could it be one guy? Could it be a combination? Could they three kids in the trench coat this wide receiver two position and stack <laughs> him up? I, I don't know how this thing's going to go. I don't think the team knows either right now. Yeah, I I don't have a good sense on answering that question because I'm not convinced that Van Jefferson makes this roster right now. Sure. No, I, I totally get that. So. Interesting things to watch, and we'll, we'll, again, the, the potential receiver trade or acquisition is looming over our shoulders here. I think things will be quiet for now, and once you get closer to camp, these discussions might heat back up. 
All right. Any other rabbit holes you'd like to uh, go down here? Uh, maybe one briefly. This is an article I have planned for Tuesday, so maybe an early preview of what I have. But uh, you know, obviously, won't, we won't have the podcast Tuesday. It's been a lot of discussion, rightfully so, ever since the NFL changed the kickoff rule and and how different things will look and such a radical change in Pittsburgh going out there and signing Patterson hours after this rule changed. In, in what ways do you think kickoffs will, like specifically, will truly? be altered. I have a post going up Tuesday that talks about some of those things. I think linemen will be used in the kicking game now, defense alignment to cover, offense alignment to to run block. I know the Chiefs talked about, we think we discussed briefly as well, that they may not even use a kicker. They'll have a safety or somebody else to do kickoffs because you know to get an extra tackler out there. Um you know, I, I think there's just a bunch of you know different wrinkles and and cool things that'll be used and different funky variations and trickeration. What are you kind of expecting more specifically in terms of these kickoff changes? Well, on, on, on defending it, you better have eleven guys that can tackle. Well, your your kicker can't say you know essentially. So right, but mm-hmm. not every team is going to have. Not every team either is going to go the route of of. They'll be watching what happens with the uh, with teams like the Chiefs and 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 using that. Uh, look, would it be a bad idea during training camp? Will, will Alex be reporting on uh, a positional player trying to kick the football off? And if so, who would that player even potentially be? Yeah, I don't know who would be in Pittsburgh. I know Reed has done some kicking in the past. They also have that rugby player, and obviously rugby has a bunch of kicking. Uh, Reed Samet, Lewis uh, Reed Samet, uh, for, for the Chiefs over there. I don't know in Pittsburgh. Typically, even in camp, they don't, don't even usually have an actual kick. Usually, it's been in the past years, Marcel Pastor is no longer with the team, which is throw the ball. Uh, but I think we'll see some position players. I think we'll see some linemen. You know, I, I guess, let me, let me bring it to Pittsburgh, you know, Somebody like a DeMarvin Leal, this may help him because he's fighting for a roster spot, has to have a really good year. Could he be used now on the kick coverage team, as in years past, where he probably wouldn't be used? I know occasionally the linemen have been used in Pittsburgh, the athletic ones. Mondo, Brett Keese will cut his teeth there early in his career, but that could be something maybe that separates a Leal from the Loudermilks and the Lees of the world, although maybe even Logan Lee gets a look out there. I don't know, uh, to try to go cover some kicks because you don't have to run the 40, 50 yards anymore. Yeah, and you, those guys have a level of athleticism to them. Right, Leal does for sure, and, and and Lee probably a little less so, but I think there's some similarities in, in their games and styles. Uh, on the return team, what about a Mason McCormick being used as one of those blockers, a guy that has good foot speed, I don't think he's a tremendous athlete, change of direction, which may pose a problem, but I think he is athletic and can move in space. We've seen him as a puller. If we're treating kick returns as a run play, which many coaches and players have said, that it is Killebrew recently compared it to a stretch play. Could you see Mason McCormick find some use in the return game? Sure. Sure. Uh, I mean, and I think, you know, guys like uh, Darnell Washington will be out there, right? Yeah. I think Washington makes sense. I mean, traditionally tight ends, they've often been out there. I know Rodney Williams is on the kick return team last year, but there might be a heightened value in having that blocking tight end who hopefully can move a little bit to, uh, to block on what could be viewed as a run play. I think the biggest question when it comes to specifically the Steelers right now, when it comes to the new kickoff rules is who's the second guy back there with, uh, uh, with Cordell Patterson. It's a great open question that does not have a good answer in part because that receiver group is so muddied right now that it's, we're not sure who's even going to be on this roster to be a possibility. I still think Jalen Warren could potentially be back there because, you know, teams are not going to want to kick it to Patterson. So you better have somebody that's a threat, uh, you know, also back there. Mm -hmm. And Warren could be that guy. One other thing I think we'll see, and this is more speculation on my part, probably even more so. But will we see live reps of kickoffs in training camp? Because you wouldn't have them live in full contact in past years because you don't want guys running at full speed that distance and crashing into each other. But with that no longer an issue, everyone's bunched up within five to ten yards. I think we'll see some live reps because you want to probably test some things out in camp before you get into a game where there's no guarantee you're going to even get an opportunity to do anything anyway based on the number of return opportunities that you get. So because you see some live tackling in training camp on kickoffs, that I think makes sense. Yeah, I mean, and they'll probably be wearing the Guardian caps, right? 
you have to, I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they'll be out there from, from that aspect to make things a little bit safer. My last point though in the article was for all the changes we've talked about, how much will actually change? I, I dug into the data some. A, even the coaches that have devised and helped create this rule, which essentially just borrowed from the XFL, admit that still they're expecting about 60% of kickoffs to be touchbacks. And so you still have more than half the time your boring standard touchback. It does come out to the 30 now if the ball lands in the end zone. That is going to be one change and one I guess consequence that may encourage teams to not uh, opt uh, for for touchbacks uh, as often. But I, I pulled the XFL data because this all comes from the XFL in 2023, right? That's what the NFL is borrowing this idea from, correct? Yes. Okay. So in 2023, how many kick return touchdowns did the XFL have at that year? Oh, I, I don't know. You tell me. One, just one. Now, granted, only eight teams, fewer games, but still only one kick return touchdown. The NFL last year had three or four of them. And as a as a league, the XFL averaged 21.3 yards per kick return, which was two yards less than what the NFL did in 2023, which was a really historically low number overall for all kickoff production. So in, in some sense... I don't know if it's going to be this touchdown fest of big plays that people think or expect. I think coverage teams will adjust and you do have now your coverage team very much closer to where the kick returner is at. I think there'll be impacts obviously in terms of the creativity. I just wonder in overall numbers in terms of how many touchdowns there will be, there'll be more, but will there be a ton more and will the average you know yards per kick return skyrocket? I'm not sure that it will. All right, so uh, by week four, a collective uh, fart sound, if you will. Can you say fart on a podcast? Uh, I think so. Okay. Uh, in other words, a, a lot of hype, but maybe not, maybe might not translate. I think to an extent, it's going to look different and it's going to be funky and there's going to be some crazy and some weird and some stuff that does not go well. Some team's going to try something insane and it's going to go, you know, uh, you know, just terribly and go viral for all the wrong reasons. But I think it's just in terms of the overall numbers, how many touchdowns there are, what's the kick return average, it may not be quite as impactful as people think that it will. Yeah, I, I think there are, are guys that are trying to draw stuff up. I think there was even an article or, or something yesterday about what Bubba Ventrone uh, getting with, uh, who is it, Vrabel or, or whoever and trying to draw up some creative stuff when it comes to that. So we'll see uh, it, it, any making that play more exciting than what it is now, whatever that looks like is fine by me. Sure. And I'm usually resistant to change. We're both men that do not like when things are different, but I am all for this because I'm tired of the kickoffs being boring. And if they didn't do this, then they probably were just going to eliminate the kickoff altogether, which I was definitely against. It should be the start of every football game. And I think this will be good for the NFL. It's it, To me, it was the best and really only way to A, make the game and make that play safer, which was partially the NFL's intent, but also make it more active. Yes, you can make it safer by just never having a return. Then, of course, you, it's going to be 100% safe if they have a 100% touchback rate or eliminate the play altogether. But that would have been terrible for the sport, I think. So doing this, although it's radical and different and funky, was a really good and smart decision. All right. When uh, when is that article hitting? Uh, Tuesday morning. Be up Tuesday morning. Okay. All right. All right, Dave. Anything else? If not, we can get to some reader emails and close out today's show. Just a quick reminder. No live stream tonight. That's just our normal schedule. But for anyone unsure of our schedule, that'll be next Monday. All right. This one from Chris Lookhart says, good morning, guys. Don't. Don't you think if supply and demand came into play, having an overabundance of wide receiver and knowing the game is extremely friendly to them, wouldn't that make the the worth of them? Would wouldn't that make the worth of them go down? Like if it's easy to find wide receivers and develop them, why would anyone want to pay 30 million for one? He says, I feel like they are what should be fungible. So in other words, he's saying with the abundance of wide receivers coming out of the college game now, I guess, and how they are used and how the game is extreme, extremely friendly, 
to them, wouldn't that make the overall worth of them go down? And, and in other words, uh, uh, keep teams from going out there and paying the $30 billion uh, price tag and all like that. All right. Interesting question. I would reply first back to Chris and say, Chris, what do you think about the Steelers wide receiver depth chart right now? <laughs> yeah, they're not finding a ton of great talent out there. And I would say if you're to present that argument to Minnesota, you know, are you going to be the team that allows Justin Jefferson to walk and hope you find the next Justin Jefferson? I get the question from the market, you know, strict market supply demand standpoint, but I think it's easier to think about that than it is to actually act that out in practice. Right. And I, you know, I, once again, I think you need to start in your own, own backyard and look, I, we, we thoroughly understand what, what, what it seems like the intentions of the Steelers offense will be this year and, and to, you know, run the football and exert their will that way and then build the passing game off of that. But at some point you've got to throw the football and you've got to throw the football down the field. You know, and I just I, I still do wonder and slash kind of a little bit worry about, you know, especially when you have a rookie in there that you're trying to develop in Roman Wilson, you know, what this will look like for the Steelers wide receiver, because, uh, you know. And do you, we expect Van Jefferson, Quez Watkins and Scotty Miller all to make the roster right now? What I've said is you take the four guys, the three veteran signings, Watkins, Jefferson, and Miller, plus Calvin Austin, and I think two of those guys of that four make the 53. All right. And does that does that give you much comfort along with George Pickens? You know? Yeah. I mean, obviously, the guys that make it would probably have impressed in some regard, but does that carry over and how much does that carry over to the regular season? All questions to, to be, you know, answered later on. Yeah, I, I, I get the, the premise because receiver classes have been deep there. There you can get a lot of good receivers in the draft, but how many great elite receivers are there and finding that guy and being in a position to get that guy usually requires a pretty high draft pick. You don't want to let that guy right away. So the market will always pay the best of the best, the elite of the elite. And I, I don't, there's, is there, there's not been an overpay in my estimation. It's a ton of money, but Jefferson is worth it. Lamb will be worth whatever he gets. Same with Chase, same with Ayuk, uh, same with the guys who've been paid so far. So the market still always pays elite guys. And from the fungibility, let me ask you this, Dave, this is going to take up 20 minutes here, but uh, oh. why, why exactly are running backs fungible? We know that they're regarded as fungible and disposable, but why exactly is that even the case? Uh, because you see, uh, to me, at least kind of the, the higher percentage of, of not drop off when you do have these former six round undrafted type guys come in and get the job done. I agree. And I think the, the two main reasons why it's fungible is a the injury risk. The running backs don't have the shelf life that other positions do. The the hits that they take when injury can really ruin their career. And the second point, maybe the primary point, as you said, is really if they're offensive line dependent. If you have a really good offensive line, you can put, you know, I'm not I, I'm a little flippant with the comment, but put put any running back back there and they're probably gonna have some measure of success. With receivers, that's more of a independent position where the receiver has to be good. Other things around them can't make them as good. A good quarterback can obviously help. A good offensive line can help a good run game, but they're the receiver just has to get the job done. They're more reliant on themselves being good as opposed to the running back where his success is much more tied into the success of the offensive line. Now, look, are there obviously exceptions to the rule? I mean, a, a guy like Christian McCaffrey, I mean, just an incredible all around player, not only as a runner, but as a, uh, a pass catcher out of the backfield. Uh, heck, I, I really questioned that trade uh, back when when the Panthers trade, you know, when, when the 49ers acquired him, wondering if the 49ers made the right decision there. And, you know, you know, in a word, I, I was wrong about that. I mean, he is, he is, he is, at, you know, uh, a threat on that offense that makes everyone around him better. There are exceptions uh, to the, to the rule. I go back to though, is really what makes a good running back, not only coming out of college, but, 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 but in the NFL, uh, 
Uh, we know most running backs, we think that if given if the if the C's part the right way, if everything's blocked up right, you get a seal here and you get a seal there. Uh, uh, those guys can can bust off uh, fifteen to twenty five yard runs. But what happened? You know, to me, the things that set set the uh, the running back the, the the more elite running backs apart is how are they a after initial contact wherever that initial mm-hmm. contact happens on the field are they are they falling forward as mike tomlin likes to say uh, are they getting the additional yards and another aspect is how are these guys in the backfield when faced with the you know with with the play not going the way it was designed to go uh how are these backs at breaking that first contact behind the line of scrimmage and getting you positive, not only positive yardage, but making the play a successful uh, play. And then really the, the other added on dimension to that is how are these running backs? uh, Well, uh, pass protection is huge, right? Uh, In, 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 in in today's NFL, uh, you've got to have guys that can not only, break it down and, 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 and see who the guy is that they have to get, but, uh, and maybe not handling them 100%, you know, taking them out of the play, but at least getting enough on them where the quarterback can get rid of the football, uh, those kind of things. And then, you know, the, the other a- added thing obviously is how they are used in the actual passing game as a wide receiver. Uh, when you start asking, when you start going through that long list of things that make that separates the non fungible uh, uh, from the fungible ones, that that list gets really really short, right? And and sure. that that's why there are the exceptions to the rule. <coughs> excuse me, like the Christian McCaffrey's. Yeah, but I, I just think broadly to the question, the elite receivers matter more in a passing world. Uh, the running back, their success is more tight. Offensive line play again. With, I, I know with quarterbacks, if you have a bad quarterback, the receiver is going to struggle more. Yes, that's true. But just in a vacuum, the running back is always he's going off of his blocking in front of him. If the O line doesn't block, the running back has no chance. The receiver's got to do his job independently. Uh, you know more so than probably the running back has to do his. And the market still always pays elite elite talent. And and look, it's more rhetorical than anything else. But teams have to spend cash too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even say that's rhetorical. It's just they have to spend something, and if you're going to spend your money, you might as well spend it on your best players. Right, play players that can make make plays down the football field of more than twenty yards or more. Because I mean that it, right. you know, the, yeah, as much uh, advanced analytics as we get and will continue to get, uh, explosive plays is something that you can't get away from. Yeah, if you can do that, you're going to win ball games. Right. Uh, okay, uh, Brett has kind of uh, wide receiver questions here. Uh, he says, so June 1st was the first date to look for a wide receiver trade. What is the last date he writes? In other words, if it hasn't happened by X, it's not going to. I don't think you can put an end date on that, uh, especially when you're talking about the Pittsburgh Steelers, because we have seen this team time and time again. Uh Right up until that, you know, the week one of the season, we have seen this team go out and add players, maybe not all the time via the trade, but but most of the time via trade. So uh, if you're if you're looking at wide receiver specifically and you're now past June the first and saying, is there is there an end date to when this team could potentially add another wide receiver, say, via a trade? I, I don't think you can put an in day. Uh, when- I think you could. I think it's November fifth. I think it's a twenty twenty four trade okay. deadline. All right. Well, there you go. You're in, you're into the season. So, and yeah. I I think he was trying to put it more of, sure. of 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 before the season end date. But I mean, point taken. Yeah. I mean, if you're in this thing, uh, come trade deadline time, and you need another wide receiver, and there's another team that's going in the other direction. Yeah. Why wouldn't you go after that player? Right. I understand the question, but yeah, my response would be you, you never take it off the table until it's fulfilled uh, or, or there's some big compelling reason to do so. But if it's if it remains a need, if it remains a, a, a missing puzzle piece of this offense, 
never close that door until the league mandates you close that door, which is now one week later, thanks to Pittsburgh's proposal to push the deadline back one week from post week eight to post week nine. That is November 5th of 2024. So I think you you never close that door um, as for a team like Pittsburgh that you would expect to be competitive. All right. Number two, last time the Steelers had a need at wide receiver and a hyper athletic quarterback behind an established veteran, we saw the advent of Slash. Do you think Arthur Smith is willing to do something like that? And if we don't see a trade for an outside wide receiver, how likely are they to consider that option? Uh, I I would guess this is mostly slanted towards Justin Fields, right? Yeah, uh, or unless he's a big John Rice Plumley fan. uh, fan. But uh, no, I, I, I don't see... Fields is not going to become slash. He's not going to become Taysom Hill lining up at tight end and playing a ton of offensive snaps. I mean, that's fun to kind of tinker around with, but that's not that's not going to happen. No, I I, I wouldn't imagine it would either. What do you think about Chad Johnson's comments about Justin Fields? Yeah, gave him a warning to say, don't make yourself a gimmick and make sure that you stay true to who you are and that you're a quarterback and should be viewed as a quarterback. So I I get that for sure. We've seen other quarterbacks. Be aware of that before Lamar Jackson in particular sticks out. That's why he never wanted to run the 40 because he knew he'd run fast. And if he runs whatever time he would have turned in, let's just say four, four, five, that would have drummed up. Oh, should he play running back? Should he play receiver? And Jackson said, I'm a quarterback. I don't want to further that uh, receiver conversation is probably a really good move on, on his part. But if you're Justin Fields and if that's your path to see the field and make some plays, you know, when you're a free agent after this year, you got to, I think, do it. Do whatever it takes to get on the field. Your alternative is to sit and be the backup quarterback and wait for Wilson to either get hurt or to be super ineffective and get benched. And so if you can still find some value in the interim, it's probably the best thing for you. But I think it, I, I certainly understand Johnson's perspective. But at, at its core, this season, you're not expecting any kind of, you know, to see, see, see Justin Fields lined up at wide receiver, right? No, no, I'm not. Okay. Uh, all right, I think we got through a couple of uh, at least the most recent ones that are in the email box here. Okay, we'll come back, Dave, on Wednesday, and we'll talk about what the team did for its fun field trip on Monday and, of course, for Tuesday's OTAs, and uh, take it from there. All right, we we shall do that. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter slash X at Steelers Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazara. Almost just blanked out there. Uh, That's okay. Uh, Follow the podcast at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, theatersdepot.com, hit the donate button. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, theatersdepot.com, hit the ad free button, upright navigational bar. So until Wednesday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.